Okay, we're going to start on the homework here for 2.5. All right, so this section involves what's called the chain rule, which is a very important um, rule when it comes to taking derivatives. It allows us to take a derivative of very complex functions. Now, there's systematic ways to approach this, and then there's just kind of a after you've done enough of these, you, you can do them without writing out formulas and, and following procedures. So I'm going to try and do these functions as best I can using uh, a little bit of both. So here's a way that I would have explained this problem in the notes. First of all, we have that um, our function, you know, y is equal to, um, we want to see we have a composition here. We have a cube root of something. And then inside of that, we have the 1 plus 5x. So the inner function would be the 1 plus 5x. The outer function would be the cube root. Now, what they're asking for here is for us to identify the inner and the outer. So the inner function would be that 1 plus 5x. So um, 1 plus 5x. And then the outer function, we refer to it as a function of 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 u. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this entire inside as being our u, and therefore the outer function is cube root of u. Now if we use the methodology that, that the book uses, they say down here, dy dx derivative of y with respect to x will be the derivative of y with respect to u times the derivative of u with respect to x. So what they do is, is they say, okay, well, well, here's our function of u. We're going to take derivative of that with respect to u. And then we're going to take derivative of this with respect to x. Now, here's how I do it. What I do is I say, OK, look, our y is the cube root of something, which I'm going to call u. And then the u is some function inside, which is just 1 plus 5x. And then what I do is I create a table and I take the derivative of each of these. So on the top one, I can take the derivative of y with respect to u because u is the variable. And remember, this right here was uh, u to the 1 -third. So the derivative of that, the 1 -third comes out. I subtract 1 from 1 -third. I get negative 2 thirds. And then I have down here, I can take the derivative of u because that's the left side and with respect to x because that's the variable on the right side. And the derivative of this, well, derivative of 1 is 0, and derivative of 5x is just 5. So what I need to do now to get my answer is I need to multiply this times this. And so that's what they have right here. Now, <clears throat> what, what you do next is, well, I'll show you this. Um, I'm going to rewrite this here. This is 1 third. u is actually... 1 plus 5x. Remember that? That comes from here. And then to the negative 2 thirds. And then we still have times 5. So now what we do is we, we take this, we drop the, since we have a negative 2 thirds exponent, we drop it to the bottom. And, and we also notice that there's a 3 on the bottom from the fraction, and there's a 5 on top. So I have the 5 on top. I have the 3 on the bottom. And then <clears throat> I'll have the 1 plus 5x to the 2 thirds. I've moved it down so the exponent's positive now. Now, raising something to the th 2 thirds is the same as squaring it and then taking the cube root, which is why what we get here is the squared. That's our whole thing there. 1 plus 5x, we're squaring it. But then we're taking the cube root of that. And so this is the answer matches up with what, what I did. Okay, let's take a look at this function here. Um, capital F of X is equal to that quantity to the fourth power. So again, what we want to realize is that we have an outer function. The outer function here is, is the last thing happening, which is that whole thing's being raised to the fourth power. The inner function is everything inside of it, and that's just a polynomial. I can take the derivative of that, no problem. So again, I'm going to follow the way that I've done it. I'm going to say that, that uh, I'll, call it, I'll call it F. Okay, that, that means this left side is f. f is equal to something, which I'll call u, raised to the fourth power. And then that thing that's being raised to the fourth power is x to the fourth plus 5x squared 
minus 5. And then I make my table. I take derivative of each of these. The derivative of f with respect to u is equal to 4u cubed. And then the derivative of u with respect to x is 4x cubed plus 10x. And of course, derivative of negative 5 is 0. And now what I do is I multiply these two together. So when I multiply those, I get, and this is going to be my derivative, okay, my, my final derivative, and it will be with, um, well, let me just write it this way. This will be equal to 4u cubed times, now I need this in parentheses because I have two terms, 4x cubed um, plus 10x. And now what I need to do is just make sure I replace my, oops, replace my u here with whatever u is, and remember u is up here. So now I can say my derivative with respect to x is 4 times now u, which was x to the 4th, plus 5x squared minus 5, all of that to the 4th power, or, yeah, 3rd power. Okay, so I've I have finished this part, and then I just have to write everything else that's out there. 4x cubed plus 10x. And that's it. <clears throat> so you can see that that's what they have right here. And they do come over here, and they I believe they factor a, two out of the, a 2x out of this. You factor a 2x out of that, pull it out to the front up here, you'll get your 8x, and then the rest of it, they kind of carry it on to the next line over here, is this. Okay, next one. All right, this one's a little tricky. Number three, <clears throat> we have y is equal to, well, first of all, notice that we have a quotient, right? So we have a numerator, we have a denominator. So if I call the numerator f, and I call the denominator g, we already know that the derivative of y will be f prime g minus g prime f all over g squared. So let me write down what f is. f is equal to r, and g is equal to, watch, I'm going to rewrite that square root of r squared plus 3 is actually r squared plus 3 to the 1 half. So there's my f and my g functions. I just need derivatives of these. Well, the derivative of f is just the, der the derivative of r with respect to r, which is just 1. So we're treating r like x. And then on g, here's where we have to do a little work. g is actually its own problem now. This is a composition. This is an inner function, and then it's it's got an outer function, which is, is the 1 half. So I'm going to write it this way. g is equal to something to the 1 half, and then that something inside is r squared plus 3. And I make my table. So I'm doing a chain rule just on this part. So g taking the derivative of g requires a chain rule. Now, the derivative of g, let me move over a little bit so I can squeeze this in here. The derivative of g with respect to u will be equal to the 1 half comes out, uh, subtract 1, so u to the negative 1 half. And then the derivative of u with respect to r will just be 2r. And then I multiply those two together, and I get basically my derivative of g, which is 1 half u to the negative 1 half times 2r. Notice the 2's cancel. So I'll, have, I'll bring that r out front. And notice that I have my u to the negative 1 half. I drop it to the bottom, and then I'll just put a square root instead. And now I need to replace u with what it was. And, and just remember that u was actually r squared plus 3. So I put down here square root r squared plus 3. Okay, so now, now I have everything. I look back over here. I needed f prime. I've got f prime. I needed g. I've got g. I needed g prime, got g prime. I needed f, I've got f. So I can just plug everything into the formula. So y prime will be equal to 
the derivative of f, which was 1, times g, which was r squared plus 3 to the 1 half, minus the derivative of g, now derivative of g was down here, r over square root r squared plus 3 times f, which was r, all of that over um, g squared. So if I take g and I square it, um, notice that there's g. If I square it, the square root goes away. I'll just be left with the r squared plus 3. Let me try and clean this up. I don't need this 1 out here. Uh, that's really just square root of r squared plus 3 minus r squared over square root r squared plus 3, all of this over r squared plus 3. And to clean it up a little bit more, what I can do is I can get a common denominator in the numerator. So remember, this is over a 1. So I'll need to get that, I'll need to introduce, I'll squeeze it in here. I'll need to introduce on top and bottom square root r squared plus 3 over square root r squared plus 3. That way we both have the same denominators there and we can put them together. When I multiply this times this, I get r squared plus 3. The roots go away. Then I have minus and then the r squared, which was the numerator up here, all over my common denominator, which is this. Then all of that over r squared plus 3. And now I have a complex fraction, so I'll write that denominator over 1. And then this is where I come in with that reciprocal, like this. These got flipped up. And when I multiply straight across there, and, and let me notice that those r squareds cancel. So I just have a 3 on top. Then on the bottom, I have square root r squared plus 3 times r squared plus 3. You could leave it like that, or you could notice that this is the same as 3 over r squared plus 3 to the 3 halves. And that's because um, this right here is the same as r squared plus 3 to the 1 half. And then this right here is r squared plus 3 to the first power. Since these have the same base, we just add the exponents. 1 half plus 1 is 3 halves, and that would give you this down here. So I believe uh, the computer would probably take either one of those. All right, let me take a look and check this. Uh, uh, where are we here? Yeah. Okay, there we go, right there. Okay, so let's make sure I've answered the entire question. Yeah, got it. Okay, let's take a look at this one. This one looks like it's going to be a little interesting. So we have composition because we have functions inside of functions inside of functions. So the last thing happening is I have a square root. So let me try and start to build this up. I think I'll go with a smaller pen here. I know that y ultimately is a square root of something. Now everything in there is this, right? So what can I say about u? Well, u, oops, u is equal to um, 5x plus the square root of something again. So we, we're going to have two variables in here, but let's just do this. 5x plus the square root of 5x plus the square root of 5x, like that. That's where we are, right? The problem is I can find up here, I can find the derivative of y with respect to u. That's no problem. I just you know, use the one-half power, bring it out. But over here, if I'm going to try and take derivative of u, we're going to need to take a look at what that is over here because um, we, again, have some chain rule. 
I can take derivative of 5x, no problem, but derivative of this is going to require some work. So I'll, I'll try and complete my table here. You're going to see we're going to run into a little bit of an issue. So derivative of this, remember this is u to the 1 half. So the derivative of y with respect to u is equal to 1 half u to the negative 1 half. Okay, now, if I try and take the derivative of u with respect to x, what I get is, well, derivative of 5x is 5, plus, now I need the derivative of this. Well, that's like its own problem because it's another composition. So I'm going to have to start like another separate piece of work down here. Okay, and I'm going to say right now g is equal to square root of 5x plus square root 5x. So all I've done is I've written this part as its own problem so I can find its derivative and stick it in over here. All right, so <clears throat> everyone please realize that g is just the square root of something. Now I'm using u again, but it's totally separate from the u I'm using up there. The u is actually everything underneath that square root, okay, which is 5x plus root 5x. So the question is, can we take derivative of these? And the answer is yes, we can. We can use our little chain rule here. We have, um, we already know the derivative of the square root of u is 1 half dg du is 1 half u to the negative one half, and then um, we take the derivative here of u with respect to x. Now here we're not going to run into a chain rule problem because the derivative of 5x we already know is 5 plus, now this is the same as, this right here, is the same as square root of 5 times x to the one half, and I can just treat the square root of 5 as a constant and then use the power rule, bring the one half out. So this should turn this should turn into whoa what's going on okay this one right here when I take its derivative should be square root of five times one half x to the negative one half and so to finally over here get the derivative <clears throat> of what g is so to get this derivative which we need to stick right in here okay we need to actually complete the chain rule here, so we have to multiply this times this. All right, so I, I'm r really running out of room. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll put it down here and then erase it in a second. So the derivative of g will be the one half u to the negative one half times now everything over here, five plus uh, root five over to root x. So all I did there was um, put the root 5 um, over 2 right here, put that right there, and then um, x is negative 1 half. I just drop it to the bottom and turn it back into a root. So that <clears throat> that is our derivative, but now I need to replace this u right here with what u is, and be careful. The u I'm using is this u, not the black one up here, all right, because that's totally separate. I'm coming back to that. So I have 1 half, in fact, I think what I'll do is I'll say 1 over, and that thing keeps popping up and I'm not happy about it, uh, 1 over 2, u to the negative 1 half comes down, and then it's a square root. Now, what was u? u was actually 5 plus, 5x five plus root 5x, and then we have times the rest of it, 5 plus root 5 over 2 root x. Now, all of that was just the derivative of g, <clears throat> and so that piece right here, right, that was the derivative of this, which is what we want to plug in right there. So let me try and put that in there. I'll get that, all that out of there. And I'll do this in black. So we have plus up here um, 1 over 
to root 5x plus root 5x times 5 plus root 5 over 2 root x right there. And now we're ready to finish this problem up. I know this is a lot of work, but um, <clears throat> let me just let you have one last view of everything, and I'm going to erase some stuff. Get rid of all this. So I actually have a chain rule inside of a chain rule in this problem. That's what's happening here. Okay, so now what I have to do is I have to take this, and multiply it times this. So the derivative of y will be equal to 1 over 2 root y, that's just rewriting this, dropping the u down, times everything I have here, uh, everything, all of that. Now, I believe I have an easy way of rewriting that. That's cheating, isn't it? Whoa. There we go. All right, so there it is. And then all I need to do now is replace this u with what u is. And remember, u is actually this stuff. So if you do that, you'll get your, your final result. And it is really ugly. And uh, I'm going to look to see how they simplify, if they simplify it. Yeah, as suspected, they leave out quite a bit, <laughs> as you can see. So I'll get to how they did that in just a second. Remember, I told you there's two ways to go about this, systematically with the tables or just thinking through it. I'm, I'm going to come back. I think what I'll do is I'll redo these problems without doing the table just so you can see the difference. Okay, find all the points on the graph of the function 2 sine x plus sine squared x at which the tangent line is horizontal. Use n as an arbitrary in integer. So when we say we want the tangent line to be horizontal, that means we want to know when the derivative of this function is 0. Right? Slope is 0. So what I need to do is I need to take the derivative of the function. So look at this function. It's got something here plus something here. So what I can do is take derivative of each of these individually. So this should be pretty clean to start. The derivative of f with respect to x is, well, first of all, the 2 in front of the sine is a constant. The derivative of sine there is cosine. Plus, now on the next piece, I'm going to need to do some separate work. I'm just going to, for the sake of, of making this easy, I'm going to call this g. Okay, g is equal to sine squared x. So notice that we have an outer function, something's being squared, and then the thing that's being squared is sine. So this is a composition, so I'm going to have to um, use chain rule. So g is something squared, and the thing that's being squared is sine x. I make my table. The derivative of g with respect to u is, u, uh, sorry, to u. to u, and the derivative of u with respect to x is cosine x. So g prime is equal to 2u, so multiply those two together times cosine x, but what is x? What is u? u is sine x, so this is 2 sine x cosine x. So write this u is that. So now I'm going to come back up here and plug this in. The derivative of this g goes right there. And we just said it was 2 sine x cosine x. So there's my derivative. Going to have to delete some stuff here. Okay, so now what I need to do is figure out when that's 0. So I will take this now, okay, and I will set it to 0. So 2 cosine 
x plus 2 sine x cosine x is 0. And this is a trig equation, so I'm going to factor it. I'm going to pull a 2 cosine x out of both terms and be left with 1 plus sine x. And now since I have multiplication, I can just set each one of these equal to 0. In fact, I can divide everything by 2 to get rid of that. So I want to know when the two factors cosine of x, when is that equal to 0? I want to know when 1 plus sine x, the other factor, is equal to 0. In other words, when is sine x equal to negative 1? So this is going to be require some review of pre-cal. Um, if we look at our unit circle, I think I can draw a circle in here. Oh, that's not what I want. Oh, no, that didn't work out at all. The thing was a little bit too big, wouldn't you say? I could have drawn a circle by now, huh? Yeah, let me just draw a circle. Okay, so if we look at our unit circle, we remember that on the unit circle, if you have some angle theta, the unit circle, this is 1, that corresponds to some point, x and y. The x-coordinate will always be cosine theta, y-coordinate will always be sine theta. So when we come up here and we ask ourselves, when is cosine of an angle, now don't confuse this x with this x, this may as well be theta, but we're saying when is the cosine function zero? So you want to go around this circle and you want to ask yourself, when is the x-coordinate on the unit circle zero? Well, the only places that that happens, that you get an x-coordinate of zero, is here and here. So this angle from here to here is, is pi over 2. And then the angle that goes all the way from here to here is 3 pi over 2. And remember, we could also go around again, all the way around and back like that. So we, we could go pi over 2 and then add another full rotation. Or we could add go to pi over 2 and add two rotations, right? Or 3 or 4 or 5 or 6. We could also go backwards. But notice that these two, two points are directly across from each other. So if I, if I come in here and I think about it this way, I can go, all right, start out, go pi over 2, and then from there, just add half a rotation, and I'm here. And then add another half, and I'm here again. Then add another half, and I'm here, and add another half. Half rotation. So <clears throat> my general solution is that my x needs to be pi over 2. But I can also add any half rotation. Now, full rotation is pi. Half a rotation is, I mean, sorry, full rotation is 2 pi. Half a rotation is pi. And I can add as many of those as I want. So I say pi n. So any multiple of pi is added to the pi over 2. That's my general solution here. Now, when I am looking at the other equation, I'm saying, hey, when is the sine negative 1? I want to come over here and I want to ask myself, okay, where is my y-coordinate negative 1? Well, the only place that the y-coordinate is negative 1 is here. And that point already get, appears in this list because it's part of the, the solutions for the other equation. So the, the only possibilities are when x is equal to pi over 2 plus pi n. Any multiple um, of pi added to pi over 2 should give me all my solutions. Now, um, let's see here. Looks like they want, and that's really frustrating. That's probably confusing to you now that I've explained it this way. Um, looks like they want to find all the points. Hold on. Find all the points on the graph. Okay. Well, now what we need to do, okay, these are where our, our general solutions are. We need to actually plug these in into this and see what comes out. So we already know that if we plug in, let's see if we plug in pi over 2. What would happen if we plug pi over 2 into that top function? Sorry, I didn't read it completely. 
They want the basically they want the y the, the function's value at these critical points also. So um, plug pi over two in here. We get sine two. I mean, I'm sorry, two sine of pi over two plus. Notice I'm not plugging into the derivative. I'm plugging it into the function. Okay. So sine of pi over two is, is one. So this is just going to be two plus. Now si, sine of pi over two is one. Then square it. I just get one. So this is three. So I'm going to get three out when I plug pi over two in. Now what would happen if I plug in um, the other point? which was 3 pi over 2, or any any multiple of it, 2 pi multiple. Um, so 2 sine of 3 pi over 2 plus sine squared 3 pi over 2. OK, when I, when I take sine of 3 pi over 2, I get negative 1. So I get this. And then plus sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1, but then I square it, so I get 1. I put those together, I get negative 1. So what they're trying to get you to see here is that you do get negative 1 sometimes. That's a smaller value. And then larger value would be you get 3. But you need the x coordinates that do that. So even though my general solution was correct here, um, right here, I need to kind of rethink this a little bit just so I can get my answers up there. And I'll draw a quick unit circle again. We know that when we're up here, that's like being at pi over 2. And any time I'm up there, I'm going to get 3 to come out. So how do I say pi over 2 and any any multiple, 2 pi multiple of it? So we go pi over 2, and then we come all the way back around one rotation. Full rotation is 2 pi. Or I could go around again. I would, that would be adding 4 pi. So to get 3 to come out, I need to start at pi over 2. I need to add 2 pi n to that. Now to get negative 1 to come out, I need to be down here at this point, And that's 3 pi over 2 but then I can add a full rotation to that and be back at the same place. So 3 pi over 2 plus 2 pi n will give you negative 1. All right, let's take a look at this uh, solution. Yeah, there we go. This and this. Finally, last problem here. I believe it's the last problem. Find the 88, 85th derivative of cosine two, of 2x. First of all, notice that we have an outer function cosine of something. The thing inside of it is 2x. So this is not just a simple derivative. You actually have to apply the chain rule. What we know is that y is equal to cosine of something we'll call u. The u is what's inside, is 2x. If we make our table, take the derivative, the derivative of y with respect to u will be negative sine u. Now, the derivative of u with respect to x will be 2. So multiplying those two together, you get negative 2 sine u. But what's u? u is 2x, so negative 2 sine 2x. So that's what our first derivative is. Okay, That's our first derivative. We want the 85th derivative, but that's ridiculous, because if we do this again, we're going to um, you know, we're have to do it another 84 times. So what we want to do is try and see that there's a pattern. Okay, So if I take the derivative of this again, what will happen is we'll have the derivative of you know, the constant's here, so that's negative 2. Don't worry about that. And then when I take the derivative of sine 2x, I have to come over here again and say y is equal to sine of something. The something is 2x. And then I set up my table, and I do my, my chain rule again. What you get is 2 cosine 2x. So that would be my second derivative. Then the negative 4 is a constant out front, and now you'd have to set up your little box you know, do chain rule on that again. But we already know what cos the derivative of cosine 2x is. We, that was the first thing we found. So we already know that that would turn into um, negative 2. This was our derivative right there of, of cosine 2x. Negative 2 sine 2x. So now I have 8 sine 2x. So 
um, this is my first derivative, f prime. This is my second derivative, f double prime. This is my third derivative. So there's a pattern here. Notice that whenever, um, hold on a second, uh, four, maybe I should go one more. So we'll be convinced of this. Um, let's go. Hold on a second. I'm getting a text here. Let me pause this. I got to answer this. Okay, back to this. Yeah, I th think what I'll do is I'll uh, I'll get rid of this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to list out what the derivatives are so you can kind of see the pattern that's, cre that's being created here. All right. You see how to do each derivative. So we know y. We know that y was equal to cosine of 2x. When we took the first derivative of y, we got negative 2 sine 2x. When we took the second derivative, we got negative 2 times 2 cosine 2x. Now, I'm not going to put the negative 2 and 2 together for a reason here. When I take the third derivative, I get negative 2 times 2 times negative 2 sine 2x. And then when I take the fourth derivative, which I'll have to write like this, I get negative 2 times 2 times negative 2 times 2 times cosine 2x. And I keep doing this. Well, notice what's happening here. Um, let's see. If I were to put this together, I've got uh, four twos being multiplied. Two of them are negative. Two of them are positive. So this should be a positive number. That should be um, 16 cosine 2x. Over here, put these together, um, I get, again, a positive, right? Positive uh, 8 sine 2x. And then these two, let's see, when I put those two together, I get negative 4 cosine 2x. And then when I put, uh, there's nothing put together there, I get negative 2 sine 2x. So it looks like the first two derivatives um, are both negative, and then the second two are both positive. Let's see, what would happen if we do the fifth derivative? Of course, I'm not going to go all the way to 85, but I would get negative 2 times 2 times negative 2 times 2 times. Now, when I take the derivative of this, that would pop a negative 2 out, and then I'd have sine 2x. So now I have um, three negatives in there, so I'm going to get negative 32 sine 2x. And when I take the derivative again, sixth one, what happens is because all of these numbers out here are just numbers, I have three negatives. All I'm going to do is pop a 2 out. It's going to stay negative. So I'm going to have a negative 64, and then the sine turns to cosine. So again, these two were negative. If I go one more, I promise this last one. I'm just really trying to get you to see the pattern. Um, I'm just going to have another 2 pop out. Um, uh, sorry, a negative 2 is going to pop out because I'm going to be taking derivative of cosine, and that negative is going to join the other 2s that are out there, and um, it'll change it to a positive now, 128, and the cosine turns to sine. So the next 2 should be um, both positive. So we got positives, negatives, positives. These were negatives. <clears throat> so the question would be, um, you know, what is, where would 85 lie in this? You know, would 85 give us a positive or negative? And then also, you know, what's the pattern with the twos? Um, let's, let's look at the twos first. Um, if you look at this first one, just the number out front, that's 2 to the first power. Forget the sign. The 4 here is 2 squared. And notice that the first derivative, first, is 2 to the first. Second derivative, we get 2 squared. Third derivative, that 8 is 2 cubed, so that's going to be third. So it looks like the derivative tells us how many 2s we have. So if we're looking at over here y to the 85th, we know that we should have 2 to the 85th power. And then we need to, to determine if we're going to have a sine or a cosine. So let's see. 
first derivative, we have a sign. Third derivative, we have a sign. Fifth derivative, we have a sign. Seventh derivative, we have a sign. So it looks like all the odds we get signs. So we should get a sign, 2x here. And the question now is, is it positive or is it negative? Well, again, which ones were positive? The ones that were positive were 2, two and 3. Uh, wait, hold on, no. 3 and 4. The third and fourth derivatives were positive. Um, 6 and 7. No, I'm, I'm messing this up. Hold on. Okay, it was like this. Okay, so which which ones were positive? We had derivatives three and four, derivatives um, seven and eight. We didn't put eight. So what would the next ones be? Well, these are just going up by four, right? So <clears throat> you add four here, you get 11. You add four there, you get 12. And, and the question is, where where is 87? Is 87 in this list of numbers? Well, we could look at this first list as being 3 plus multiples of 4. And we ask ourselves, is, 80, is 85 there? So let's try and solve this. If we subtract 3 from both sides, we get 82. Does 4 go into 82 evenly? So will I be able to find an integer that will make that happen? And no, it doesn't. So let me try this. Let me try the other list, which is this one. 4 plus multiples of 4. Does that ever equal 85? So does 4n ever equal, subtract 4, 81? No, that's not going to happen. That's not an integer. So I know it doesn't happen in either one of those lists, which means it has to happen in the other list. Now, we're pretty much done. Okay, we can, we can say that this is negative, but let me show you, you know, why it's in that list. The list where we got Negatives was when we had derivatives 1 and 2, 5 and 6. And again, we could see we're just adding 4 to these each time, 9 and 10. So this first list is basically 1 plus multiples of 4. Can that be equal to 85? We'll subtract 1 from both sides. You get 84. And then divide through, and you get 21 for n. So it looks like yes. There is some integer where we will get 21, so it will appear in that list. Therefore, it had to be in the negative list. Therefore, that's our answer. A little bit involved. Now, let's see. I had brought up where their answer. I think it's this one. They really just um, kind of jump over everything, but here it is right here. Same result. Okay, let's see where my video time is here. 43 minutes. Yeah, I would like to. I'd like to try and redo this. Uh, let me erase everything and come back. Okay, I'm going to work through this homework again, but I'm going to do it the way that <clears throat> eventually you would like to be able to do this uh, without all that table stuff. So here's my first one. I want to find the derivative. Okay, so the way I do this is I say, okay, the last thing happening is cube root, so I, I'm going to act like I'm just covering that up, and I'm saying that that's something to the one-third. Well, the, what is the derivative of something to the one-third? It's one-third times that something, and then subtract one from the power, you get this. <clears throat> now, what was it that was raised to the one-third? It was one plus five x. Okay, now that I've done the one-third, I look inside and I say times, what's the derivative of what's inside there? Well, the derivative of what's inside there is just five. If you check it, that's exactly what we got earlier. Okay, this one, <clears throat> again, I have something raised to the fourth power. So if I want to know what the derivative is, I know the derivative of something to the fourth power is four times that something to the third power. Now, what was the something? The something in here was exactly x to the fourth plus 5x squared minus 5. Now, I've done the 4 on the outside, and now I need to look inside and say what's the derivative of that, and just attach it here with multiplication. The derivative of that is 4x cubed plus 10x. And if you check again, that was the answer we got earlier. Now, for this one, 
I can't avoid the fact that I still have to use quotient rule, okay? But I can still do this without writing a whole bunch of stuff down. The derivative of this will be the derivative of the top, which is 1, times, times the bottom, minus the derivative of the bottom. So let me just write that down right here real quick. There's the bottom. The bottom is the square root of something, right? Here's the something, and then I have a square, square root on the outside. Oh, getting a phone call, sorry. Okay, so the, the thing on the outside here is the square root. So what it, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what is the derivative of the square root of something. Well, it's 1 over 2 times the square root of that something. But what was the something? The something was the r squared plus 3. Now, because this is a chain rule, I now need to attach to that the derivative of what was inside. Now, the derivative of what's inside was 2r. And then, because of the quotient rule, I need to attach to that, next to it, the r, which was, you know, let me get back up here, f prime g minus g prime, and then here's f. And then all of this is over g squared when I, when I square uh, the bottom, and you just get that. And again, if you look back, um, we should have had that um, result earlier. The 2's canceled. I had r squared up here. You know what? I don't remember having r squared up there. But I think we did. Yeah, because it canceled with that r squared. Yes. Okay, so that is correct. All right. Um, next one. This one's going to be a little bit um, cool because you'll see how this works out so much, so much easier if you can do it the way I'm doing it, right? You know, instead of what we did with this one earlier. So I'm going to start with the outside. Okay. What's the, what's the outside function? Well, it's the square root of something, right? What's the derivative of the square root of something? It's 1 over 2 times the square root of that something. Now, what's the something that I'm talking about? Well, I'm talking about everything under here. So I'm just going to tack that on inside here. 5x plus square root 5x plus square root 5x. So what I've done is I've taken care of the blue part. So I, I no longer need to consider that outer square root right there. Okay, I'm done. So chain rule says now multiply that times the derivative of what's left. So here's the stuff that's left without the square root. Well, what's the derivative of that? Well, the derivative of 5x, which is its own term, is just 5, plus now, again, notice I have a square root again. And underneath it, I got a bunch of junk, so I'm going to have to do chain rule. So what's the derivative of the square root of something? Well, it's 1 over two times the square root of the something. Now here the something is just the 5x plus the root 5x. So that's what goes in there. It's the something that I was taking, that was raised to the, or, or that I, eh, the something is the part that looks green there, right? Okay, now chain rule says continue times the derivative of that, that green part. Well, the derivative of the green part is just 5 plus and then we did this earlier. What's the derivative of this? It came out to be root 5 over 2 root x. And that, close that parenthesis, that is exactly what we would have had earlier. Or that is exactly what we had earlier without all those steps. This technique requires a little bit of, you know, work, I guess. You know, you have to get real comfortable with it. But so much quicker once you get it down. Okay, look at this one. F prime x. Okay. Remember, we had two terms, so I can just do these individually, 2 cosine x plus. Now here, I have something being squared. The derivative of something being squared is 2 times that something to the first power. Now, what was the something that was being squared? It was the sine x. So that's what goes in here. Then times, now that I've done the squared, I take derivative of sine x, which is cosine x. And, of course, sine x to the first power here is just sine x. So we get 2 cosine x plus 2 sine x cosine x. And that's the same exact thing that we had earlier. All right, now this one, there's no easy way to do it other than the way I showed you. So there's not going to be a shortcut there. Um, you still have to you know, find the pattern and get your derivative. All right, see you.